All right. So welcome back. Um, we have Art History Tuesday this week, and I believe next week as well, but not the week after that because of our um, <clears throat> sort of uh, weird spring break schedule that we have this year. So I'm going to have a little bit of um, allergies today, so like some hay fever. So if my voice is sounding weird if I'm sniffly, it's definitely because of the sheer amount of pollen that is starting to fly through Richmond right now. All right, so our opening question is, how does an artist show their own story in their work? Yeah, and um, can you be telling two stories at once in the work? Yeah, definitely. And we see that a lot in the artist's work that we're looking at. Not only are they sending a message about <coughs> something, but they're also uh, sort of uh, telling you something about themselves. This is a time in history um, we're getting into, like, the 1940s, essentially. So this is um, uh, around post-World War II, a little bit into World War II. Um, and uh, the art world has changed a lot since the Dada movement that we saw last week and is accepting a lot more. But also the understanding of psychology is becoming more and more uh, important in the art world. So we're going to look at two artworks today because we only have a few weeks left. And with this one, you can type on the board one thing that you think you see happening, and I'll do the other. A bull maybe stepping out from behind something. And then this is so we and what I see happening over here is some sort of victim looks like they're falling. Like maybe they've fallen through the stairs or something. So what makes you wonder about this piece? Ooh, yes. What does this represent, and why is it so layered and complex? So this piece is incredibly symbolic, and you're right, it is very layered. We're looking at the piece Guernica by Pablo Picasso. I didn't write that name up there. I'll do that real quick for reference. I know we talked a little bit about him off of the recording last week, um, a little bit about what we know about Pablo. So I'm going to have to say some things on the recording to give a frame of reference. So for starters, um, what culture is Pablo Picasso from? What country? Spain, right. Um, so Pablo Picasso, one of the most famous artists of all time, um, he actually got his start when he was really, really young. He was a child prodigy. So kind of like when you think of like stories of famous kids who like get started in the Disney Channel or you know, Mozart of Art, right? Like you started on the Disney Channel and such at a really young age, and they become like major actors at the age of eight or ten. Like, what does their life happen? What happens to their life normally after like 16, 17, once they become adults? Are those child stars normally very active? 
in the like movie world. Sometimes, right? Sometimes they do. They find a, a groove to stick with. Um, and you know, uh, but a lot of times when they turn 18, they essentially age out, especially if their skill set in acting or music was only in that they were a child, right? So if they didn't find other skills quickly before they turned 18, then they were no longer novel anymore. Pablo Picasso was really aware of that. Now, Pablo Picasso was one of the finest young draftsmen ever. And a draftsman means a drawer. So he could draw. And he was so amazing at his drawing skills that at the age of 12, he could draw better than master artists at the age of 35. Um, so uh, he was truly a genius of his time. And uh, the th clever thing about Pablo is as soon as he realized that he was no longer becoming uh, popular, he would essentially found a new movement. So when we think of Pablo Picasso, and we think of like his blue period and things like that, there's a famous quote that I don't know, I'm sure I'm going to butcher it, but it roughly says that I was born knowing how to draw like an adult. So as I grew up, I had to learn how to draw like a child. And this is the era of art in which artists start to become interested not only in human psychology, but also in um, children's art, actually. And uh, you're starting to see the abstract movement form, and no longer are they trying to be purely realistic. So we know that Pablo Picasso could draw easily as well as a Renaissance master, and yet we see an image like this, right? Um, this piece is giant. I don't know how big your living room is, but it's probably as big as one of your living room walls. It is a huge painting, only done in black and white and gray. And there's also some textures added in here. It looks like text and stuff. It is a huge piece. And this was made, I believe, for a World Fair. And um, back in the day, there used to be World Fairs where there were different pavilions from different countries represented around the world. And uh, Pablo Picasso was asked, asked to uh, submit a painting to represent Spain. And uh, Picasso was definitely very attached to his Spanish heritage, even though he lived most of his life in Paris. Um, but that's just kind of because that was like a cultural hub, kind of like in the 90s where a lot of people wanted to move to either LA or New York. Um, anyway, uh, as the story goes, uh, Pablo Picasso was asked to create a piece to represent the Spanish pavilion. And he did this piece inspired by a uh, small town in Spain that fell victim to um, basically a civil war. It wasn't the full on World War II. It was, maybe it was, the, I forget which country was coming to attack them. But this country essentially meant to um, bomb a major city in Spain and ended up also getting the small town as well called Guernica. So the title is the name of the town. And of course the townspeople weren't ready for it at all. Um, so they quickly had to try and um, hide and save themselves from the bombing. And if you think of a small rural Spanish like I say truly Spanish Spain um, life, what are the most valuable assets to a farmer? This is a farming town. Animals and crops, right. You can't bring the crops in to protect from um, the bombings, but you can bring the livestock inside. Um, so people, there are lots of accounts of people trying to bring in their horses and chickens and all everything that was important, especially the cows and the bulls um, inside. But as you might guess, if there are bombings happening on the farmland, how do you think an animal will react inside or not? Crazy, right. So imagine these giant animals stomping, running around in the houses. 
people who were unprepared for this, um, and then many got trampled. Yeah, like dogs with thunder, right? Many people got trampled in their own homes trying to protect their livestock. Um, and this isn't unusual. This still happens today um, if the town isn't prepared. There were actually, at this, at this point in history, there were lots of preparedness stuff in the U.S. on how to hide from a bomb. This was at the same time in which they started telling people, you know, kids to hide under desks and stuff if there was going to be a nuclear bomb. Um, the fear was rising. So Picasso painted this scene of the tragedy that was happening inside. In effect, that, you know, maybe the people bombing had no idea would be a big deal. Um, but sort of, you know, in trying to protect what you love, it was also destroying you. And so we see the chaos inside, and it's loaded with symbolism here. And I talked with you a little bit about it last week, um, but Pablo Picasso is not a humble guy at all. He knows he's one of the best artists of his time. He does not doubt that. Um, Therefore, every piece that he has ever made also represents him as well, and he openly talked about it, too. Um, it wasn't something that we had to look into deeply. Um, Picasso was like, yes, this also represents me. And can you guess which character in here is supposed to be Picasso? You can circle it on the screen. Mm, you think that because this seems to be like some sort of hero or savior, but actually, it's right here. Um, which always surprises people. He doesn't cast himself as the human in this piece. He is, in fact, the bull. And um, if you start to look into Picasso's works, you see that his bull, I know, right? His, the bull is his symbol for sure. And um, it's, you know, strongly represents his Spanish heritage, right, the bull, but also represents his, like, walk through life. He, uh, he's aware of his destruction and his, also his veracity. So um, if he is the bull trampling, then who are these other people? his family and other artists? Yeah. So it's mostly his family, um, particularly his wives. So um, in the course of his life, he had three official marriages and then uh, many unofficial uh, partners that he was dating while he was married. And uh, we don't know for sure if um, Pablo Picasso pushed these women to it or uh, he may be just attracted to women who are on the edge, but two of the three women in his life did die, um, did commit suicide while married to him, um, which is a pretty intense track record to have. Um, once again, we don't know the full details, but we do know that him being an open womanizer and cheater and stuff obviously did not make a, a safe and happy household, for sure. So. Um, many of the other uh, figures in here are debatably some of the women um, in his life, and this is him, you know, internalizing that and understanding that in this piece. Um, and this character right here um, is actually one of his last wives. I don't even remember if she was official. Um, but when he was in his 60s, I believe, maybe his 50s, um, he was dating a woman who was only like 25, um, and uh, he, they got married. She was a photographer too for his artwork, and uh, she also lost a baby. So you know, she got pregnant, had a child, and the child, um, I believe, died before the age of one. I don't remember the full details of it. There's lots of documentaries about this stuff. So this is him like looking over and almost mourning this tragedy that's happening with her. And so this is definitely a piece that was at the height of Picasso's fame. Um, 
which was really always very high. Like, he was a very popular guy throughout his entire life. And we see, like, basically double layers of tragedy here. The tragedy of Guernica, um, the event, and he's really looking at the tragedy of his own life, kind of from an old age mindset. So, yeah. So this link right here um, is pretty groovy. It should only take you a few minutes, but this is really cool that we are now at a point in history in which artists can, sorry, artists can, um, we can catch them on footage and video. Uh, we can start to see that they are real people and not just like awkward self-portraits that we're sharing. But if you want to watch that link real quick, And then just respond with what surprised you about the artist from seeing the video. Yeah, um, he was kind of always a trendsetter, and um, yeah, also he was always kind of of the time. He was very aware of art movements and who was hip and who was cool, and uh, worked to make sure he could fit in anywhere. And it's pretty cool. Um, he was such a big deal at this time that he was, you know, uh, followed all the time by uh, broadcast and news companies and documentary companies see his work being done. Um, and this is nice that we're getting into this age in art history in which um, our artists are becoming real people. So we're going to transition now from Guernica to this next piece as we're having a double um, art history feature day. So once again, you can choose what you think is happening in one part and I'll write the other. <laughs> it's a face horse creature, totally. Um, we still don't know. It's not completely certain. And then obviously I'm gonna say the melting clock. So what makes you wonder about this piece? <laughs> right. Um, what is this creature thing? Why are the clocks melting? 
where are we? Um, there's a lot of that going on here. So the title of this piece is called Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali, which once again I didn't write up the name. Can you do that now? Salvador Dali. Um, and we are looking and definitely like we're in like the 19, uh, late 40s into the 50s now. Um, and this movement is uh, really sparking through the world called surrealism. And it's spelled. But like Picasso was a, a, a many movements in, throughout his life. But Salvador Dali was always in this movement of surrealism. And it's really impacted how uh, we see art today. And that word surrealism, uh, obviously, we can see the realism in here. Um, he's trying for a lot more realistic depth and space and things like that. But the sur word means almost like un, so unrealism. So this is um, supposed to be what it's like when you're dreaming. So surrealism is the art of the dream. Um, and we see here this, the title Persistence of Memory and we're seeing the melting clocks and stuff. Um, how do you think this relates to your dream state of being asleep? Yeah, for sure. All of these are believable things, like I've seen a platform in my life. I've seen uh, some cliffs in my life. I've definitely seen clocks in my life and some weird desk in my life and trees. I've, everything here I've kind of seen before, but it doesn't quite fit. Um, and that's something that they call juxtaposition. I'll put it in the chat box. So juxtaposition is a really good, um, I spelled it wrong, <laughs> it's a really good SAT word. If you use it in any of your papers and when you're writing, your teacher will think you're a genius. Um, and it, all it means is putting things next to each other that don't belong, right? So clocks that make sense to us, but the, what, something that a clock wouldn't do is melt, especially like this melts enough to be hung out to dry like on a tree limb. Um, so this is, they do things, all they do really in surrealism is take things that we're used to and do something that's unexpected with them. And um, it's a pretty simple formula to follow through with and if you try and do that on your own, you'll find that very quickly you'll make unreal images. And <coughs> Salvador Dali, um, as another Spanish artist, but to be Spanish didn't matter quite as much to him as it did to uh, 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 Picasso. And he was a very, very strange guy. Um, he was another celebrity of his time. Um, he would, when other men would, were wearing really simple mustaches or no mustaches at all, he had a giant mustache in which he would take the tips of it and wax it to a point so it looked like two needles sticking out from his face. Um, he was really strange and surreal um, in his own life as well, so he truly lived out surrealism. Um, and his movement is what the Dada artist became. Uh, but he was, I remember there was a story about hiding out from Hitler. So he got his started in the 40s, you know, during World War II. And of course, though the movement continued well into the 60s, so it was about uh, 20 years long the movement. Um, and the story is he actually came to Richmond out in the Goochland area, so west of Richmond, kind of where Short Pump is today. And um, as the story goes, <laughs> uh, 
people were driving by and stopping and because they were saw this really strange thing happening. They saw a man with a pointed mustache directing um, some workers to raise a car and lift it into a tree. And this was supposed to be a surrealist sculpture by Dali. So Dali was actually living in Richmond to hide from Nazi Germany. Yeah. And he was creating his surreal artworks here as well. And because of that, because there were so many people who were considered undesirables under the Nazi regime coming to the U.S. and hiding out from Europe, there was a huge art exchange that was happening at that time. And a lot of our uh, New York-based artists and L.A.-based artists were really inspired by this. And Salvador Dali was also close friends with a famous animator of this era. Can you guess who? Yes, exactly. Walt Disney. So um, you can start to see how some of this almost looks cartoon-like. Um, Dali and uh, Walt Disney had planned a movie, an animated movie together. It was to be a work of art, not your traditional film. Um, and sadly, like I believe Walt Disney died before they could ever make it. But the movie is called Destino. So several years ago, you can find it on YouTube really easy. Um, so several years ago, uh, the Disney Animation Studios pulled out the plans, the original sketches, and the drafts of what the movie was going to be, and they animated it for him in honor of Dali and uh, Disney working together. And if we have time at the end, I'll pull it out for you and link it in. Once again, if you can look at this video here, it's pretty short. This is an interview of Dolly himself. He says some interesting things about what it is to be an artist. Yeah, he was kind of humble in a way. Like he like didn't want to be defined as much as many other artists, um, which is a, he had a very rare personality type. Um, in almost all of his footage, he would go on TV and stuff, but you can tell he was probably kind of an introvert, um, trying to fit in with everyone else. Um, but he was also just so strange. He just really played that up too. I feel like when you when you show people that you're, tra you're strange, they expect you to be strange, and thus that also can allow you to be strange, if that makes any sense. <laughs> but um, while you were watching that, I found the link to 
Destino, and I have it right here. If you want to watch it later, it's six minutes, um, and it's a really beautiful animation, and it's a very great uh, combination of like what surrealism is, and it's nice to see. So our question for honors today is your social reaction. Does fame make the artist's work better? And this is, I think, a, a question that needs to be asked all the time. You can interpret this question as, like, does everyone have to, do, not everyone, but do people have to like it in order for it to be likable? Save this honors question real quick. And you could also probably answer this question or think about your answer by deciding if a, a certain piece wasn't famous. Would it be would it uh, be not as good, or or if the artist making the piece wasn't famous, would it be kind of considered worse? So it's one of those it's kind of a loaded question. It's, you think you know the answer right away, but we're probably going to sit on it for a minute. All right. So unlike last week, <laughs> uh, we're no longer uh, connecting pieces from last week to this week. We're just going to do the ones we had today. Um, so why don't, uh, before you describe like the style of one, you can call this one like a G for Guernica and this one for P for persistence of memory. So whatever you, one you're referring to, just write, you know, the process of P, or P equals, um, and I can give an example real quick. Cool. All right. Oh, and people are still painting in oil right now, by the way. <laughs> We're about to come up to a time in which they develop acrylic paint. Acrylic didn't come about, I think it was invented in the 60s, but people didn't start using it until the 70s. So it's a really new art medium still. And maybe the style of persistence of memory can be, yeah, right, impressions of memory on subconscious. I love it. Okay, and we will move forward. So this is an uh, easier part, compare and contrast. We all love the compare and contrast. And we'll say both are symbolic.
Mm, you're right. They both are abstract. I should use a different word. I'm going to say geometric. Ooh, you're right. They're both Spanish. <laughs> um, I would say the one to the left is almost more cartoonish. Yeah, on the right is more real. I put that in quotes. The realer of the two. Cool. All right, now I'll move to the next slide. So you can refer to either here. How do, does one or both of these works to impact the art world? Right. And um, the left, we see like Picasso's double message here, one about Guernica and one about his life. And the right, um, we have to interpret a lot more of surrealist paintings. They don't always tell us what they mean because um, they're supposed to be dreamlike. We, we can start to question time itself and the idea of persistence of memory, time melting. And um, also we can start to wonder a little bit more about uh, the experiences that Dali has in his life, and um, does he feel like time is passing? Lastly, how does this impact you? Now turn off the recording at this point. 